But most of the record that's received at the observatory is called harmonic tremor and differs somewhat from normal earthquakes. The harmonic tremor that's received by the instruments can be likened to the record that you would get if you shook a jelly. The volcano just shakes and shudders like a jelly, sometimes for days because of the movement of the liquid to the surface. Here quite violent harmonic tremor is recorded and here much less violent, quite placid in fact, uh, tremor is recorded. By comparing the harmonic tremor records from different instruments on the flanks of the volcano, it's possible to locate the site of the major movement upward of liquid towards the surface and therefore of course predict where an eruption is likely to take place. Prediction of likely eruptions can also be made by measuring changes in the volcano's uh, profile. The volcano swells as material moves towards the surface and poles, calibrated poles, placed at the corners of triangles, move upward and relative to one another as the volcano swells. A sensitive leveling instrument placed in the center of the triangle and sheltered from the movement of wind can measure the movement of the poles up and down. Here deflation followed an eruption and inflation is occurring probably to predict or as a precursor of another eruption. Laboratory observations can also be made of, or field observations, can also be made of the distance between fixed points on the volcano. This instrument projects light about five kilometers from a marked point on the volcano to a reflector on the other side of the crater. And by measuring the time that it takes for the light to be reflected back to the transmitting instrument, very accurate measurements can be made of the distance between the instruments. Usually there's a change in distance of several centimeters immediately prior to an eruption. So measurement of the change in distance can also allow prediction of an ensuing quake. Once an eruption begins, then laboratory readings are supplemented by actual observations from observers at the site of the eruption. They're in constant radio contact with home base, so to speak, and report on the height of fountaining lava and on the uh, suspected temperature of the lava and so forth. And that supplements the readings which are made on seismometers back at the central observatory. The eruptions on Hawaii are both spectacular for the tourist and important for the scientist. The regularity of the eruptions allows scientific observations to be made every day. One doesn't have to wait 10 years for the next eruption. And that's important for drawing conclusions which can be applied to other volcanoes which erupt less frequently. Mechanisms for predicting the eruptions on Hawaii can be applied to other volcanoes that seem to be, to be dormant, the techniques of measuring tilt and expansion and so forth, and the movement of magma beneath the, the volcano can all be applied to other sites. And these predictions have already allowed villagers to be evacuated from sites in Hawaii on the flanks of Kilauea, where eruptions have subsequently engulfed the village. Such precautions will probably soon be possible at many other potentially dangerous volcanic sites. The volcanic activity in Hawaii, which is where the volcano Kilauea is situated, is typical of one of the five differently located sites of volcanic activity that we briefly looked at at the beginning of the program. So let's return to those five different sites and look at them in more detail and pay particular attention to the origin of the magma. In the first case, where lithospheric plates are splitting in the center of an ocean, 
this is a mid-ocean ridge, the lava is basalt lava, and it's derived from the asthenosphere, which lies beneath the lithospheric plates. In the second case, which is also a case of the splitting of a lithospheric plate, the lava, again, is basalt, and again is derived from the asthenosphere. This is the kind of volcanic activity that's associated with the splitting apart of continental lithosphere and is the first stage in the growth of an ocean between two uh, fragments of continent. In the third case, the lava is a, again basalt, and this is the Hawaiian example. In this case, too, the basalt lava is derived from the asthenosphere, and you'll remember that the asthenosphere is we think about 10% liquid. And it's the collection of that liquid and its movement towards the surface which provides the lava in these first three cases. In the case of Hawaii, the difference to the first two is that the volcano sits within a lithospheric plate. Hawaii is well nearly towards the center of the Pacific lithospheric plate. In the fourth example, the origin of the lava is very different. In this case, the um, <clears throat> volcanic activity is at a subduction zone where a piece of lithospheric plate is diving down beneath another. And the volcanoes grow on the edge of the overriding plate, if you like. And in this case, the lava is derived by the melting of the downgoing slab, which is, of course, quite cold on the surface where it's cooled by the oceans, but becomes much hotter as it gets deeper within the Earth. Just like um, igneous rocks don't crystallize all at once, so the plate doesn't melt all at once. And in fact, uh, the lava is derived from the melting of about 20% of the plate. And the first mineral to begin to melt, or to begin to change is better, uh, is pyroxene. And pyroxene changes into garnet, the mineral garnet because of the increase in the pressure and the temperature. And when that, in, when that change takes place, the elements aluminum and sodium and silicon and oxygen are released. Atoms of those elements are released, if you like, in a molten form. And also, from micas, the element potassium is released. And it's the collection of these elements into liquid form, which rises and forms a volcano on the margin of the overriding plate. In the fifth example, the mechanism of the derivation of the lava is quite similar. But in this case, the volcanoes are built on a piece of continental lithosphere, beneath which the uh, oceanic lithosphere is descending. And as the molten material from the descending plate rises, it becomes contaminated or it mixes with molten material derived by the heating of the continental lithosphere.